this is more of a, a learning talk, just to kind of give you um, an FYI of stuff that's in the orchard. This um, topic came to my attention from a suggestion from a grower um, last year. And so this grower said, it'd be nice to have a talk to hear about, like, what are all the microorganisms that you can find in an orchard? Because sometimes I'll throw out terms other than bacteria or fungi, and, you know, I, I take for granted if folks know it or not. So today is, a, is more of a learning day I mean, as far as for this talk. So we're going to be talking about um, several different microorganisms that can be found in the orchard, one of them being viruses, and this is apple mosaic virus. And believe it or not, this is more common than not. It shouldn't be more common than not, but it is. The next one are, oops, oops. The next ones are viroids. And so viroids, these are less common in the orchard. Um, you probably will not come across this uh, anytime recently, uh, but it's just more of a put something on your radar. They do exist in fruit crops. Uh, phytoplasmas, uh, X disease. This is very much in our peach orchards in the mid-Atlantic. It's in Pennsylvania, um, no, it's in Delaware and some of the peach orchards there. This is definitely here. Oh, my seeds. These are the fungal-like organisms, uh, your phytophthora. You may know this already, but it's also good to sort of have a review as far as why f the true fungi and the oh, my seeds are different. And then bacteria and fungi, we all know these. We encounter them all the time. So for day today's purposes, I am only going to focus on these four groups, and we're going to cover what it is, why do we care about it, how do trees become infected? What are common diseases associated with these organisms? And the general management strategies. Basically, can you spray for some of them or can't you spray for some of them? And then the last bit I'm going to chat about is for bacteria and fungi, they can exist in the orchard as epiphytes, endophytes, or parasites. It's always good to understand the differences between those different types of existences. <laughs> So first, viruses. Viruses are just genetic material, DNA or RNA, that's wrapped in protein. And they can only replicate in living cells. And when they replicate in living cells, this is how they cause disease. So this is just a snapshot of the diversity of plant viruses that are out there in general. This is just to illustrate, A, there's a huge diversity, and B, they come in all different shapes and sizes. So they can be super tiny, and they can be super long. Uh, it looks like they look like noodles, or as I call them, they look like little geometric uh, soccer balls. And so virus, uh, when a virus causes disease, it can manifest in different symptoms in leaves and in fruit. It can have overall stunting of a plant. But what would be characteristic uh, leaf symptoms would be like intravenal chlorosis, vein clearing, mottling, mosaic, stripes or blotches, leaf curling, stunting, crinkling. Now, uh, one thing to caution is that I'm well aware that herbicides can cause similar symptoms. So it's always a good idea if you ever see funny leaf symptoms showing up in your orchard to sort of do a very methodical, um, you know, step-by-step -step understanding of how that could be because if, if, herbicides can cause very similar symptoms to those. With fruit, though, the fruit can be distorted uh, in shape. They can be much smaller. You can have ring spots on them, pits, modeling, or line patterns. And how viruses are named, plant viruses are named, it's, it's very straightforward. When a virus is discovered, it's the host it's found in, the symptom it's caused, and attached virus to it. So if you have apple mosaic virus, it was found in apple, it creates a mosaic pattern, virus. So that's how, that's how viruses are named. So, and this is an example here of apple mosaic virus up close. And so why we care? Well, it can reduce budding success, which is very critical in tree fruit production, can influence tree growth and ultimately the lifespan of the orchard, and especially when trees are infected early. And viruses are especially important with some of the Geneva rootstocks. So the Geneva rootstocks are the it rootstocks these days that everyone's trying to get their hands on. Well, we've learned the hard way that some of them are very, very sensitive to virus. So they must have scion wood that is completely virus free in order for budding success to be um, to take place. Uh, for diagnostic symptoms, what can be frustrating is that some viruses show no symptoms. They can be latent. And so you don't see any symptoms uh, uh, as a result. But also the symptomology can be influenced by cultivars and also the susceptibility as well of the tree. And as I mentioned, you can have 
ob no obvious symptoms. So as a result, I mean, the viruses are smart. <laughs> so they know how to make themselves more of themselves and propagate themselves. And you can have unintentional distribution when you have a virus-infected plant um, not showing any symptoms. So there's no ability to sort of stop it in its tracks. And then finally, some viruses are very important quarantine pathogens. You remember plumpox virus that affected Pennsylvania back in the day? Very, very important um, quarantine pathogen. So as far as the major minor viruses associated particularly with apple, we have apple carotid leaf spot, um, leaf spot virus, apple stem pitting, and apple stem grooving viruses. These are unfortunately very, very common. They're latent, meaning that they don't show any symptoms. And they're only, uh, I should say, they're only transmitted through propagation, through grafting. Insects don't transmit it. You can't touch it and move it. It's just strictly through grafting. So it's all about, so obviously then in the nursery, they're starting out with um, infected budwood, unfortunately, but you don't want these viruses in your trees. You also have um, apple mosaic virus and tomato ring spot virus. These are a bit more problematic because they are symptomatic. Apple mosaic virus is primarily transmitted by grafting. Tomato ring spot virus, which is probably the most important virus for you in tree fruit, it's transmitted by the dagger nematode, and this can kill trees, both apples and peach trees. Minor viruses, cherry rasp leaf virus and tobacco ring spot virus, these can be transmitted by both grafting and dagger nematode. As far as I'm aware, these aren't very prevalent out east. It seems to be more problematic on the west coast, but it's still of concern, especially since the bulk of the tree fruit industry and the nursery production is out west. And so, as I mentioned, the virus that is most important to you primarily right now is tomato, tomato ring spot virus. So this can show up, as I mentioned, um, infecting peach trees and apple trees. And in apple trees, it's called apple uni necrosis. Uh, oop, in case you, apple, apple. Um, stone fruit is called prunus stem pitting. So in apple, this is an example of apple uni necrosis where you have uh, death at the graft union of the tissue there, the, the stitching. And so you then consequently you would get breakage at the graft union. This, this incompatibility or this breakage is often resulting due to the resistance or tolerance of the virus in the scion wood versus the rootstock. And that's why you sort of get this battleground here and you can get death there um, at, with the death of the graft union. For prunus stem pitting, you will see pits or grooving in the wood. It's pretty obvious. And also you'll definitely see sort of a line of demarcation between the scion and the rootstock. And you can get overall decline of the trees and, as well. And it's quite obvious. There, is, there are no sprays or there are no products out there that you can apply to your trees and cure trees of viruses, okay? And I need to emphasize this because I'm well aware of the market out there of some of these products that claim that they can cure everything but the common cold. <laughs> so if you see something that says, oh, this is a bactericide, fungicide, and also viricide, it's not. It's, it's completely inaccurate. And so it's, I need to emphasize that very strongly just because I'm well aware of this sort of market out there of folks pushing products like this. The only way to avoid virus is number one, through vector management, the dagger nematodes. This is the one that's really most problematic for us. Tomato ring spot virus is transmitted by the dagger nematode only. And so you manage dagger nematodes, you're going to manage the, the potential for tomato ring spot virus. Also managing the reservoir host for tomato ring spot virus, weeds. Weeds, there's tons of weed species out there that can serve as reservoirs for tomato ring spot virus, and it will be asymptomatic in those weeds. But the dagger nematodes see it as like, ooh, roots, I can feed on them. They'll unwittingly feed on those weeds in your row middles and then move over to your trees and un, un, you know, infect your trees. So it's very important that you have good nematode management preferably before you plant your trees. Um, so whether it's through biofumigation, through like the green manure, through sorghum sudex or rapeseed, or through chemical fumigation. Roguing infected trees if growth is subpar, and especially if you find out that you do, you've done, you know, have gone through some testing and you find out you have hot trees, it's important to remove those trees. And then buying virus certified free trees from reputable sources. It is becoming harder and harder for this to be achievable because of the technology that exists today. 
Because we have this very deep sequencing or high, through se high throughput sequencing, we can literally find a needle in a haystack. So consequently, we're finding a lot of previously undescribed viruses in tree fruit that we did not know were there. At right now, we don't know what role, if any, they play in any kind of disease, but we know that they're there. So the question becomes, how do we regulate all of these different organisms? And it may be a point where we can never truly have virus-free stock, virus-free trees. But our goal might be to make sure we, those trees are devoid of the most problematic ones. Uh, this is a very hot topic of discussion among uh, the nurseries and among the state, the regulatory folks, as far as trying to achieve uh, virus, uh, controlling viruses in tree fruit production. Viroids are very similar to viruses with the exception they don't have protein, they're naked. It's just the genetic material and their RNA, and they're super, 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 super tiny. And so why we care is because they actually, despite their size, they pack an enormous punch. They can cause premature fruit death, and they can also really affect the quality of the fruit. And how do trees become infected? Well, through propagation, unwittingly you know, um, propagating trees from infected stock. And then it can actually spread through seeds and infected tools and possibly root grafts as well. I was unaware of this and I found this out through the, the Washington State folks. Uh, as I said, viroids don't seem to be a real huge issue here, but there are some pretty important viroids in tree fruit, which are apple scar skin viroid and apple crinkle fruit viroid. This is really problematic in Asia. Uh, it's it's terrible. It's a it, um, back in whenever it was uh, they weren't sure what was going on. It was like crisis level as far as as the impact it was having. Uh, so as you can see, it causes this blotching on the skin, and over time, this can like become necrotic, and it can scar over. And here, it's the fruit. The fruit is seriously misshapen. And then we there is a new one, a new virus in, or new viroid in the United States called apple hammerhead viroid. Again. No idea if this causes symptoms, but because of the technology we have today, we were able to find this new viroid in Apple. Like viruses, there are no sprays, no products that you can apply to trees to cure them of uh, the viroid infection. The only way is if you know you have viroids, and hopefully you don't, but in the event you see something weird in your orchard and you have it tested, you definitely want to rogue it and get rid of it. And again, it's the same thing as viruses, as buying certified trees. And so as far as I know, they, they specifically screen for the most problematic viroids that affect fruit trees. Um, viruses are the, or seem to be the ones that, um, that is becoming uh, more and more problematic these days. Uh, because I know in some states, because of how, much latent, how many latent viruses are find, found in tree stock and in trees, they're like, in, for instance, New York State is really taking, um, Cornell University is really taking an active role in helping the nurseries make sure that they have a good program uh, with regards to producing good, clean stock. So, you know, stuff has, put, unfortunately, has fallen through the cracks over the years, and a lot of this most likely is due to the demand. The science isn't keeping up with the demand. Okay, phytoplasmas. This is the one you may have experience with. These are bacteria-like organisms that live in the phloem cells, much, much bigger than viruses. So this actually you can just see with a compound microscope. Uh, they, why, as far as why we care, well, they're very economically important. They can reduce, you know, basically the, the productivity of the tree anywhere from 10 to 80%. It can reduce fruit size. And also there can be uh, quarantine pathogens with them. And so how, are, how do trees become infected with phytoplasmas? Well, these guys are transmitted by insects, specifically leafhoppers and scylla. Uh, they've got the right material, or I should say the right uh, equipment to be able to transmit uh, the phytoplasma. And so what happens is that eggs overwinter, uh, and then you may have, you unwittingly, there are phytoplasma infected trees nearby, they hatch, those insects go to feed on those infected sources, and then they go and infect, uh, they feed on clean trees and they infect those trees. And so it can also be through propagation as well. As far as the diseases caused by phytoplasmas that we're most concerned about, well, number one, X disease. I mean, this is something that is quite, uh, not, is quite common, it's not uncommon. Aproproliferation, 
phytoplasma. This is something that is significantly to worry about. It's up there with PPV, with pump pox virus. And a few years ago, there was a threat of this in Canada. Supposedly, the Canadians were doing some tests. It came back positive for apple phytoplasma. Everyone was holding their breath, and then they found out it was a false positive, which was we dodged a bullet there. But this is something that I know the Pennsylvania Department of Ag routinely screens in their stone fruit stocks of nurseries. And pear decline, this is more problematic out west where we have a majority of pears that are grown, um, but this is also, um, a, you know, a, the decline is caused by a phytoplasma, which is transmitted by an insect. Uh, so as far as management of particularly X disease, it's worth taking a minute or two to discuss this since this is something that is here, is first of all, all prunus species are susceptible to X disease. The key reservoir is choke cherry. So if you get rid of that choke cherry, you are, that's half the battle right there. The symptoms, uh, you can have twig dieback, and unfortunately the twigs and branches that are infected with phytoplasma are more sensitive than to winter injury. In the summer, uh, you would see more symptomatic symptoms like uh, more significant uh, symptomatic, I'm sorry, more significant dieback. The leaves will turn different colors, yellow and, and reddish. You may have different irregularly shaped lesions or, or blotches on them, water-soaked uh, lesions or blotches. The leaves will curl up, but a real diagnostic symptom is this cluster of leaves at the tips of the branches. Very characteristic. Also, fruit can be affected. And so those roots, uh, the fruit on this cherry tree that's infected with phytoplasm or X disease is very much, much smaller than your typical fruit. And when a tree is infected with X disease, with this phytoplasma, it's, it is, its lifespan is significantly reduced, so it can die in two to six years. One thing to note is those symptoms, the majority of those symptoms, can mimic other diseases as well, like bacterial canker, which affects so fruit. Uh, so it's always important that if you see funny symptoms, you don't jump to conclusions. You need to sort of do a methodical approach to figure out what could be going on. But what's characteristic for phytoplasma is that cluster of leaves. Bacterial canker will not show that cluster of leaves on the tips of branches. So as, as other managements, um, it has to be tested. Uh, and I have the Pennsylvania Department of Ag. Um, I imagine, uh, you know, I, I doubt that the plant disease clinic at the University of Maryland has the capabilities to do this because I know Penn State doesn't have this. However, I'm not sure. So it may be the state ag department who would be testing this. Also, um, with tree fruit, Pennsylvania Department of Ag accepts out-of-state um, samples. So they have tested samples, I know, from Delaware when there has been stuff that's been suspect. So their routine, especially um, with, with problematic viruses and, and X disease. Uh, cultural management, removing the choke cherry and removing diseased peach trees and vector management, disrupting the habitat, frequent mowing, anything that will prevent that establishment of the scylla and hoppers from establishing and will insecticides too at the right time. Okay, moving on to oomycetes. So these are, you folks know these, this is Phytophthora, Pythium, Downy Mildew. These are your true, your, these aren't true fungi, these are actually considered water molds because they prefer being around water. And these are what their spores look like. These are called zoospores and they can swim really, really fast in water. That's why they get their, their name as far as water molds go. Why we care? Well, if you've, anyone grows anything, they know they've encountered Phytophthora at some point. It can cause significant plant death. And then in the case of tree fruit, uh, we have issues with crown rot, collar rot, root rot, especially during really, really wet periods. They can survive in soil for a really long time, which means when you have old orchards, old orchards can withstand a lot of junk in the soil and still survive. So you may have big old trees and there could be Phytophthora that's in there, but it's not killing the tree. You remove that orchard and if you don't do anything to remediate that soil before planting a new orchard, those young trees that are planted immediately back into the soil will die, will most likely die if there is any kind of Phytophthora population in there. And I've observed this happen and they'll die very, very quickly. So as far as management goes, you want to make sure that when you're pushing old orchards, removing old orchards, that you do something to remediate that soil prior to planting. Usually for a year or two, you want to do that. 
Phytophthora can live in the soil a few years, but as long as you're doing something active, even green manure, which takes care of, uh, which takes care of nematodes, will also help with knocking back the bad guys, the bad microorganisms in the soil as well. Uh, as far as other management goes, it's best as a preventative. So your typical fungicides aren't going to cure or treat Phytophthora infections. You know, so the, for the tree fruit growers, um, you know, your Maravons, Indar, Fontellus, Inspire Super, that's not going to touch these, these microorganisms. The products you want to be using are Ritamil, Profite, Rampart, or something similar to that, Aliette. These uh, fungicides, and I use them in quotes, but they're labeled as fungicides, these are true systemics meaning they are absorbed into the plant tissue and they'll translocate up and down the tree, down into the roots, especially where you want them to go. And so this is great for this disease, but you need to put the products on in a preventative fashion. So before the problem starts occurring, if you have a really wet period, and like it was in 2018, it would have behooved folks to have gone out there and put on these preventative sprays. Okay, the last bit here as far as so shifting to bacterium fungi and how they exist. So first, epiphytes. Epiphytes live on the surface of the plant parts and they don't cause disease. That's what the epi, epi, sur, ep, like surface of the plant. And so an example is Erwinia amylabra. So they are epiphytes on the stigmas of flowers. When the Erwinia amylabra is on the stigmas, they are just minding their own business. They're feeding off the proteins on that stigma, and, it's, and they aren't causing disease. It's not until that bacteria is washed into the nectaries, and then they turn parasitic. Um, so once they get into the plant, they shift their phase in life, and they become parasitic. A bacteria fungi and yeast can exist on the leaf surface as well. Um, some aren't problems, some are asymptomatic and, and really just aren't any issues. And oftentimes this is how we find out our bio, different biocontrols, um, biocontrol products that are out there is because these are epiphytes that are on the leaf, uh, the plant surface. So endophytes, in contrast to epiphytes, these are organisms that will burrow into, I use burrow just as, as more of a descriptive term, they, they will gain ingress into the plant tissue and anchor in. Uh, they will not show any symptoms. They coexist with the plant just fine, passively um, deriving nutrients and such, not causing disease. Uh, or, um, fungi organisms like Calatotricum species that causes bitter rot in apple, causes anthracnose on, and crown rot on strawberry, on blueberry, on peaches, this has an endophyte phase where it's latent. It just, it anchors into the plant tissue, doesn't cause any disease. Botrysphere dithidia is another one that's an endophyte where it anchors in, it's everywhere, anchors in to the plant and it's not until it gets a certain cue that it turns parasitic. And so now not, all path, not all organisms will turn parasitic, but in the case of our purposes today, uh, like Calatotricum and Botrysphere, they exist as an endophyte phase and then become parasitic at certain point of the life cycle of the plant. Uh, so, when, so basically at this point in the case of Calatotricum, you need to have your fungicide on to control it prior to it penetrating the plant tissue. Because when it's in this dormant phase, this endophyte phase, fungicides aren't going to touch it. Fungicides are on, they're only um, most effective, I should say, when the spore is germinating, when you have an active infection going on. The dormant phase, fungicides don't touch it. It's completely protective. And, and so then at some point, there's this magic cue. Uh, either the plant, the tree is stressed, or it's at a certain time point in development of the fruit, you would get bitter rot or white rot with Botrysphirium. So it turns as a parasite. So the parasite attacks. It attacks a living organism and causes disease. So to end this, great with time, uh, viruses, just as a reminder, no sprays. Viroids, no sprays. Phytoplasmas, no sprays. Phytoplasma is all about, man like as far as Reservoir host management, same with the viruses, reservoir host management and vector management. For the omycetes, the fungi-like organisms, these are your phosphorus acid-based products or metalaxyl. This is the Ritamil. In one of my Pennsylvania meetings, it was brought to my attention, there is Ritamil resistance in Phytophthora on pumpkin. And so the question was, 
is there any chance of Ritamil or metalaxyl resistance in tree fruit? And think, not that I'm aware of, because I use so infrequently than it is for Phytophthora on pumpkin. And so that's probably why we aren't seeing any resistance issues to Phytophthora that could potentially be attacking tree fruit. For fungicides, you've got your, um, for fungi, you've got your fungicides, your copper, your bacterial-based products. These are like your general biocides. And bacteria, it's the antibiotics, the copper, the bacterial-based products, your general biocides. Just as a reminder, fungicides will not fix bacteria infections, and antibiotics aren't going to fix uh, fungi infections. I'm sure that goes without saying, but I feel like I have to just point it out just in case. The last thing I just want to mention, and this is for your radar, as far as new products that are out there to control different bacterial pathogens. So these are called bacteriophages. These are viruses that are specific for bacteria. Phages only attack bacteria. They aren't gonna attack fungi. And they're found in nature, and they're target specific. They look like little lunar modules. And what they do is they land on the bacteria, they inject their protein into the bacterial cell and blow it up. That's how they manage the disease. And so they need a lot of bacteria in order for the phage to make more of themselves. So there is a direct relationship between how much phage is around and the bacteria that's around. So products that are available right now are primarily through Certus. They've got this agrophage for fire blight, which of course targets Erwinia amoeba, agrophage for citrus canker, and agrophage for bacterial canker on tomato. And I'm sure that some folks in here who've heard me speak a lot thinking, why hasn't Carrie been talking about phage? Why, you know, this sounds awesome. It's not. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's significant challenges with using phage in the environment. Everything looks great in the lab in the greenhouse. Once you take it out in the environment, that doesn't always mean that what happens in a controlled environment is going to behave the same way in nature. And this is oftentimes a very difficult concept for researchers who have no connection to the environment to grasp. I've worked with phage for a number of years and I've never been able to get it to work. And the company has pushed forward with the product. It seems it might be doing something up in Michigan and in Canada, uh, but I'm a little skeptical of the data because when they did use it, their overall incidence of fire blight was significantly low. I have tried it every which way in Sunday. I mean, I have tried it, putting it on at night since it's UV sensitive. I've inoculated at night. I put the bacteria on first, followed by the phage. I've mixed it with serenade or tomato juice or beet juice to act some kind of, uh, some kind of sunscreen protectant. I could never ever to get it work. So I'm pretty um, not a fan of phage for fire blight. And so I would caution folks jumping on any bandwagon. The real stipulation with phage working is, as I mentioned earlier, you need enough of that bacteria there in order for the phage to work. With open blossoms, it can be you know, really problematic whether or not you have bacteria there. You know, in our case, there's a good chance there may or may not be bacteria, but you need that food source for the phage to work. So, in for, and I think it's problematic because we have such a finite period of when bloom is open. And so this is where I see the, one of the drawbacks of phage for fire blight, where I see the strength of phage for other bacterial diseases is something like for bacterial canker of tomato or bacterial spot on peach. So with these, with these bacterial diseases, the leaves, the there's a huge bacteria source there. The bacteria seems to always be there. So there is a great food source for the phage to be able to replicate and keep the disease in check as far as the bacteria to sort of keep chewing on them and, and blowing them up and making more of themselves. And I've heard through the grapevine that it seems to have been very promising with the bacterial canker and tomato. They're in the process of developing a, a phage mix uh, for bacterial spot on peach and I started working with this this year or this past year. It's still in the early stages, um, but I'm, I'm a little more optimistic. And another, uh, another challenge is that there's a great chance of the phages drying out, so they need some sort of level of wetness moisture for them to survive as well. So they aren't, they're quite delicate 
phages, like most viruses are. I mean, when they're outside the host, they're quite delicate. So the jury's still out, but like I said, I'm optimistic for bacterial spot on peach. And just as another thing is that when you have these phage products, they're a cocktail of phages. It's just not one phage because actually you can have bacteria that can be resistant to phage. And so that's why they make sure they put a cocktail of different phages in there in order to attack whatever population's out there. So with that, I've got like a couple minutes, right? A couple questions, if anyone has any questions. But thank you. Uh, for, just, just one, I know you're working on some issues, I think in apples, yeah. or yeah. are you going to discuss that in the next talk? Or? Well, actually, so hold on. I, can, I, have, I have a slide for that, because I took it out because I wasn't sure about time. So I had a summit. Um, this is rapid apple decline. Uh, this is a mysterious issue that has been afflicting everywhere where apples are grown, a mysterious decline of, of apple trees. And there doesn't seem to be a smoking gun as far as what affects it, what, what's causing this. So I decided to be the person to organize a meeting of folks, of everyone I could think of in the apple industry who would agree to sort of come and listen and share their thoughts. And so I held this in Winchester, Virginia in the early December, and I had nurseries, growers, consultants, chemical companies, academic researchers, federal researchers, I had regulatory people, everyone in Canada was there too, uh, I, from across the United States. And so it was a nice, a nice concoction, cornucopia of folks. Uh, we had about 70 people in person, about 20 people via video, and so it was, it was a nice group of people. And what, this is sort of was the general discussion. We have people share what research, a little bit of research they've been doing, and they also, um, and we just had a discussion. The goal of the meeting was not to figure out what's going on. It was to discuss all the, the range of issues that could potentially have a factor in this and then a path forward. We didn't get quite to the path forward, it was just more discussion. Um, but I'm hoping to have another meeting this summer. So what was the general gist of this? Um, it's been in the last 10 years. Something's happened in the last 10 years that has changed. And it's primarily M9 rootstocks, NIC29 being the worst. Uh, and um, 337, any of the M9 clones. Bud 9, there have been a few reports, but 41 and 935 have been really problematic. Opportunistic fungal infections have been observed, and this just means that the tree's been stressed somehow. So what could potential stressors be? Herbicide injury was a very hot, lively topic. Uh, extreme weather event was also a very hot, lively topic. And another um, idea was orchard topography, because some folks had said, They've seen hot spots in their orchard of this problem where they may see like 10 trees in the road die and then there's nothing. And then they may like kind of a few rows south of that, uh, they'll see in the similar area another 10 rows, another 10 trees. So it was a kind of weird pattering, but it does seem to maybe some trends in, as far as related to orchard topography. There was a lot of discussion about how we grow fruit trees today and how fruit trees are grown in the nursery. It is not a secret that there's tremendous pressure on the nursery to produce a lot of trees. And back in the day, folks were asking for a couple hundred trees at a time. Now, because of high density, growers are asking for thousands of trees in an order. So that's a there's there, there is that demand for a tree. So as a result of demand, something could be slipping through the cracks, like quality control, because of said demand. And so there was quite a bit of discussion about the nursery side, the orchard side, that we're expecting a lot of trees to perform with less than what they've had in the past, as far as, as, as moisture in the soil and soil itself. You're packing in a lot of trees and expecting them to do a lot in a short period of time. Uh, we talked about like previously undescribed microorganisms like viruses. Uh, and I f my group has found a new virus and we're trying to figure out what role, if any, we're studying it carefully to see where does this virus fit. I, I don't know, to be honest, but I don't think it's helping the situation. Uh, I don't think it's the cause, but I don't think it's helping. Also talking about other previously undescribed, as I mentioned, there's this new apple hammerhead viroid, which we don't know what role this is playing or if it's even a threat. Uh, and then could this be a combination of factors, which is I think ultimately what this is what it is, this apple decline problem. But I think honestly, in my opinion, I think it starts in the nursery and then it just, and then there's just this confluence of factors that are faced in the orchard and then just everything just kind of falls apart. That's, because I've seen stuff start 
problematic even at an early stage, but it takes time for it to manifest. So, but everyone is, um, at least the, the few nurseries that I've interacted with, everyone seems to be on board. And, we're, and I stressed, we're not pointing fingers. We need to work as a team, as an industry, because this is a threat by not understanding what's going on because it's not going away. Have you seen it on self-rooted trees, you know, and on root stocks that's more, uh, give you a taller tree? Or is this more like Jean, with the dwarf? It's roots? just the dwarf trees. It's not problematic in semi-dwarf, like self-supporting trees. We do not find any semi-dwarf that are affected. I have, yeah, I mean, I've got two new semi-dwarf blocks that are five years old and they're perfectly fine. It's my, it's my dwarf, it's the dwarfing, it's the dwarf trees, it's the high density system. That's where this issue is predominantly focused. So I'm glad I kept that slide. <laughs> I thought, let me put this at the end just in case, so. All right, thank you so much.